hear you? I couldn't. Ask. Let me just, you know, I'm doing something tricky because um, there was again another update in Keynote or Zoom and things stopped working. So I'm trying to get this window correct. Yeah, I, I believe you should be able to see my entire presentation at the moment. Good, good. Um, there's nothing hidden. Everything is uh, in the slide here. <laughs> so, um, yeah, G good afternoon, everyone. Um, first off, I want to thank the organizers for putting together um, what I expect to be a very interesting workshop covering a really broad range of topics. It's a pity that I'm unable to be there uh, amongst you. I suspect, though I'm not sure, that a number of old friends and colleagues are in the audience, so I greet them from here. Um, I didn't see them in a long time. Um, so today uh, in this talk, um, I'm going to uh, share our recent work studying the crossover from a perturbative to a non-perturbative perturbative regime of QED, quantum electrodynamics. Uh, I'll be discussing that in the, uh, in the context of an artificial Josephson junction-based atom coupled to a high impedance resonator. Uh, and the focus will be on the behavior of the spontaneous, spontaneous emission dynamics uh, of the atom. Uh, so this is um, really in line uh, and uh, a continuation of our early work on quantum electrodynamics of superconducting materials. Some of the relevant published work uh, is, is listed here. Um, the work I'm going to talk about today uh, should uh, soon be online, it's, it's not published yet. Um, um, and that has been done with my uh, postdoc Kanu Sinha and my student Said Khan. Okay, right. So here's um, an overview. The talk is uh, roughly divided into two parts. In part one, I will uh, revisit the problem of spontaneous emission in a resonator. Uh, I will discuss issues in modeling and computation of spontaneous emission dynamics in engineered media and point out some challenges in modeling spontaneous emission um, or the Purcell rate uh, in complex engineered media. Um, so in part two, we'll be discussing the specific question of how spontaneous emission looks like in a non-perturbative regime of light matter coupling. And I will present a proposal for studying the crossover uh, from the non-perturbative to a non uh, perturbative regime of light matter coupling using a high impedance cavity QED system. Uh, we'll be talking about the theoretical framework based on a singular function expansion to calculate quantum dynamics in such resonators. Uh, in particular, uh, we will see that this approach provides an exact set of hybridized modes for open cavity QD systems, uh, providing some intuitive explanation of what's going on in dynamics. And if time permits, I will discuss uh, an extension of this technique that uh, currently we have for uh, a one dimensional you know, transmission line based systems um, to three plus one D modeling of superconducting materials based on discrete differential forms. Um, yeah. So um, in, in free space, any atom in an excited state decays to its ground state the probability of finding the atom in the excited state decays exponentially with a rate that depends on the third power of the frequency of transition. This is the archetypical problem of quantum electrodynamics, one that tells us about vacuum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field sensed by the atom where it's sitting. Um, so, we are going to talk, uh, be talking about the modification of this behavior when we enclose uh, this two-level system in, into a resonator, an effect that was first quantitatively studied by Ed Purcell in 1940s 
And what is expected, what we know is that the decay is still exponential in time but, um, in, in the right regime, but the rate strongly depends on the frequency of excitation um, as, as shown here. Um, and it's relative detuning from the cavity resonance frequencies. Uh, later, we'll discuss situations where this dynamics can substantially deviate from exponential decay, in particular in this, um, in what I'm referring to as a non-perturbative regime of atom field coupling. So thinking about this problem, um, especially in a complex cavity, um, one would naively think that we should not be needing to worry about the Hilbert space of the electromagnetic degrees of freedom outside a given volume um, that contains all the material degrees of freedom, yeah? Uh, because one, the, an excitation has left the atom and the cavity, there's no other material object nearby to scatter the photon back. Um, but, um, and that would be also very convenient because it would save us uh, a lot of Hilbert space resources about the degrees of freedom lying outside this volume. Um, so, but how does one formulate a quantum field theory in a finite volume with trans transparent boundary conditions? Yeah, so I want, once light comes in from inside, I want it to leave as if, you know, this is just an imaginary surface. And if something comes from outside, I want it to enter this uh, region. So uh, how how do so in particular two, there are two questions you know if you can do it um, how how uh, to do this in a gauge invariant way because it turns out when we have you know you deal with finite quantum electrodynamic systems uh, imposing gauge invariance is tricky and um, second question is what modes should be used to quantize such a theory. Um, a finite computational domain for the computation of spontaneous emission dynamics or any other quantum dynamics of materials lying inside is important for certain situations. And I want to give a couple, you know, very um, sort of specific cases. Um, one classic instance where there is no clear boundary of the resonator or the emitter. Um, is out when the emitter is outside the resonator structure or there's no clear boundary of the resonator, yeah? And another way to think about such situations, um, as I'm showing here on the left, um, lower left corner, is uh, uh, such situations invo involve overlapping resonances um, in the spectral domain. Uh, so you, you may have a sharp, few sharp resonances as shown here, um, on top of a uh, broader background, right, um, such as here. Um, and what is uh, the spontaneous emission rate or dynamics when I tune the atomic transition frequency omega j between two high Q resonances, such as here, uh, dominated by a broad non-trivial background? How do we compute that, right? Such situation may well prevail, for instance, in, in a dispersive readout um, situation, scenario. And let me illustrate that things can be rather complex. Um, here, there's a different perspective on this whole thing, on, on this uh, calculation in the spatial domain. Uh, if we tune the emitter um, in this, in this um, that is positioned here between two dielectric cylinders, if you wish, or spheres, um, if you tune the emitter between two high Q resonances of this photonic molecule structure, um, the region is, that spectral region is dominated by very lossy modes. A few of them near the frequency of the emitter are shown here. Yeah. One would conclude the emission will be quasi isotropic. What happens though, if two cavities have the right sizes and the gap between them is right, the emission turns out to be extremely narrow. Yeah, so I've specifically, we have cooked up this situation to be in that uh, to prevail. So uh, this is, um, you know, this, this can be understood as a collective interference effect of many broad resonances, each of which by themselves emit quasi-isotropically. There's no single mode in the spectral region 
of the emitter that looks like this. Yeah. So um, this, in a way, this is a multimode interference effect, and you'd like to capture this in the quantum dynamics of the emitter. A, another, you know, relevant situation arises in, um, in, in actual modeling of quantum computing chips. Uh, you know, if you peek in inside a fridge like that, you will see that your chip containing a superconducting qubits, it's um, uh, basically embedded in a box, um, in a 3D box. And um, that box has um, resonances itself, and there are chip modes and so on. And you, you end up with situations where those chip modes and box modes can interfere with what's going on on the chip something that you can you know, take as a um, essentially crosstalk between, uh, between um, qubits on the chip if you don't design these structures right. Um, so it is important that you, you, you'd be able to model these structures like that. So you need then all possible, conserve all possible computational space and draw a boundary uh, around this box um, to do compute quant computation for quantum dynamics of what's going on inside the chip. Besides issues of computational efficiency, the calculation of the Purcell decay rate in perturbation theory in coupling to all cavity modes is found to lead to divergences, um, as first pointed out by these two experimental papers here. Um, and this problem is reminiscent of divergent series in the lamp shift uh, that, you know, that is well known. The radiative correction due to vacuum fluctuations to the atomic transition frequency, except that these radiative corrections now have to be found for not for fundamental particles, um, but for an oscillating condensate um, that sloshes back and forth across a thin insulating barrier in a piece of metal. So interestingly, uh, you know that's so that's 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 a complex problem. Um, and interestingly, a semi-classical formula for antenna loss gives pretty uh, accurate results for spontaneous emission, um, finite and accurate, in contrast to a perturbative uh, quantum theory of, um, of, of a cavity and a qubit. Yeah. So we understand the resolution of this issue now through a manifestly gauge invariant calculation that is uh, non-perturbative and light matter coupling. Um, for, for those uh, interested um, um, in, the, in the audience, you can find um, some, a, a perspective on this uh, problem in these two papers. Um, now, to be clear, this resolution is reached only within an internally self-consistent effective quantum field theory uh, that we know how to carry out consistently only in one plus one dimensional systems, like transmission line systems um, coupled to atoms. Yeah. So uh, quantum electrodynamics of superconducting materials really still harbors a number of very interesting computational as well as fundamental problems. So I'm moving now to part two here, um, sort of summarized the state of um, thinking in QED of superconducting materials. I'm going to focus on a very specific problem. So consider um, now a very long cavity, but with good enough mirrors that the modes are well resolved. Uh, so it is a high finesse situation. And we implant an atom at the position xj, let's say on one end of the cavity, that is a transition frequency omega j. And imagine we can increase the overall coupling of the atom to the modes, yeah, that's G. Of course, the coupling of the atom to a cavity mode N generally depends on the atomic dipole, dipole moment, P12, and the spatial structure of the individual modes phi N at the emitter position XJ. Um, but one, one can globally um, increase the coupling to all modes simply by increasing the size of the transition dipole moment P12, you know, one, one way of doing that. So this is a situation we have uh, studied in a um, context of an optical cavity um, uh, in, in a 2014 paper shown here. Um, so what we find there is um, that the coupling 
uh, goes through as it goes through a couple important uh, scales. Um, um, there's a crossover between uh, different behaviors of spontaneous emission dynamics of this two-level system. So I'm plotting here the occupation probability of the excited state of the atom um, as uh, time progresses when you started in the excited state coupled to such a cavity with many modes and a long cavity, a situation like here, spectrally the atom is here, and I'm uh, inc increasing G and we will start with, you know, this is sort of, you get exp exponential decay when G is very small, uh, much less than kappa, the nominal decay rate of the cavity. And we have an exponential decay of the atomic excitation with a well-defined rate. Um, and this rate is different from the free space spontaneous emission rate, uh, the Purcell decay rate. Yeah? This is called the Purcell decay rate. Now, when G reaches a scale kappa and goes beyond it, uh, one crosses over to an underdamped decay. So I'm assuming that the cavity, that the atom can only decay through the cavity to continuum here. Um, so here's an underdamped decay. This is a well-known, well-studied strong coupling limit. And the oscillation, uh, this underdamped oscillation, the frequency scale here is approximately vacuum Rabi frequency G. Yeah. Um, now, finally, when G reaches a scale of the order of the mean free spacing delta C and beyond, the dynamics crosses over to one of pulse emission. Yeah. Here, the physics is that of, a sponta of spontaneous emission in the form of uh, pulses that are emitted. The pulse uh, travels over to the other mirror, um, reflects, gets reflected, some of it decays and comes back to the atom and Rabi flops it again. And so in, as a result, you get these um, revivals, if you wish to, to call it that way, of the atomic dynamics. Um, and this sort of the characteristic time scale between the revivals is of the order of cavity round trip, round trip time. And that's simply the inverse mean level spacing. Um, so now you start resolving this. Um, so uh, the, this, this, uh, the interesting, uh, this pulsed emission regime or revival regime has been observed uh, in, in, in the paint, uh, in Oscar Painter's group um, just last year. Um, so that, that's, um, that's really, you know, we, I, uh, you can increase G further and you can hit, G can hit the frequency of transition itself um, and then um, uh, omega J. And then we have the ultra strong coupling regime and I'm not gonna be discussing that here, yeah. Um, but there's another interesting perspective on the same regime. It was uh, also pointed out that in the, what, what, what I call the multi-mode strong coupling regime, what Pierre uh, Meister and, um, and Meiser here denote as a super, super strong coupling regime, um, the cavity modes can be significantly modified in this regime. So this paper studied atoms trapped in an optical lattice uh, uh, in a resonator, you know, very different system where G can be enhanced by the square root and N of the number of uh, collocated atoms at a given space time point, space point. And the physics here is somewhat different. Um, you know, we have mobile atoms and so on and so forth. But the suggestion that the modes of an electromagnetic system that is not fixed is made here. And that's very interesting. Um, so uh, I'll come back to that um, in this talk. So today I want to provide a unified perspective on, on this physics of crossovers. Um, the crossover from a perturbative to a non-perturbative regime of coupling and an appropriate formulation of the problem of spontaneous emission dynamics that is intuitively clear um, and uh, addresses some of the challenges I discussed in, in quantum electrodynamics of superconducting materials I discussed before. And we wanna do this within a finite volume with transparent boundary conditions. Um, so I wanna do this in the particular context of high impedance superconducting QED resonators. Such non-perturbative regimes uh, just discussed can be reached when the atom um, a Josephson junction atom is uh, coupled to an array of Josephson um, atom here is coupled to an array of Josephson junctions. Um, the, 
um, which make a high impedance uh, resonator. Um, so yeah, these junctions are larger in size than this one. So we have an atom coupled to a resonator situation. Um, the issue is a bit complex here. We do not have a simple enough way to tune the dipole moment of the artificial atom independent of the coupling to its environment, while uh, only one atomic transition still stays the relevant one. So that's difficult, but friends um, and colleagues, um, probably uh, one who is sitting in the audience, uh, uh, Nicola Roche and, and others, uh, figured out uh, starting around 2017, 2018, how to uh, get down to that regime. Um, and I will state just that this can be done experimentally. Um, and, um, and this helps this, you know, making this resonator high impedance line just slows down the light here. And that, you know, makes the cavity in a way appear longer, let's say. Yeah, so it brings that, it, it, that makes it possible to see this kind of uh, non-perturbative regime. Um, okay, right, so here's the model. Uh, this is a very similar structure to the one studied in uh, several experiments in recent years. Uh, the one main difference is the, so you have an atom, yeah, coupled to a very long in high impedance um, line made of Josephson junction and Josephson junction array, and that is coupled to a waveguide in, in this model here, an infinite waveguide. And um, the one main difference here is the existence of a coupler, yeah, which has an inductance and capacitance that is different than the inductance and capacitances of individual units making up the, uh, the high impedance line. So atom plus coupler plus Josephson junction plus waveguide. Yeah. The transparent boundary condition here will be implemented after the last node right here of the, uh, of the high impedance resonator of after phi n, the node n. Yeah. And uh, so it's the waveguide field. So the sort of the discussion starts with uh, breaking down the waveguide field, field into a right propagating and the left propagating modes. It is clear already here that the right propagating component carries signals from the cavity and left propagating component carries noise from the rest of the waveguide into the resonator. So then one can simply write the Heisenberg equations of motion uh, for the reduced system of the atom and the resonator only. Um, and one has to include then also one node of the waveguide. It turns out um, that I will call that the boundary or surface node. And this makes up this vector of quantum fields phi and q reduced. Yeah? So this only doesn't really, you can write these equations down um, and that is uh, the, this ability to break the waveguide modes into chiral components provides you two components here that is only active in the last side, M plus one, which is, corresponds with the zero sides here. One provides dissipation, turns out, and the other provides the corresponding noise coming to the waveguide, yeah. Um, so, then uh, I'm, I'm skipping a lot of technical details here, but it's rather straightforward. It's the same set of equations you normally write down, but you write this in this funny way. Then you can simply integrate. So here we will first neglect the nonlinearity of the emitter, which we are going to um, we can take into account by multiple scale perturbation theory, as was discussed in an earlier work um, from from my uh, my group. Um, so because it's a linear system, you can uh, integrate this out um, and simply find the solution by a Laplace transform. You see the solution for the flux field um, on all the nodes is denoted by this uh, sort of uh, um, this um, uh, bold um, notation here. It can be written as an integral over a piece that is um, a propagator, right? This piece is a standard propagator of, of the Josephson junction line coupled to a linearized atom. 
But this piece now that is only active in this last site right here is includes the dissipation. And this propagator is now essentially the kernel that um, has a functional dependence on the Laplace coordinate S or the frequency I capital omega. Um, and it multiplies this big term here. And you see that's simply the source term that you have seen in the previous equation here, the source term here, um, plus the source term plus initial conditions of, of, of the reduced part of the system, yeah. So, um, uh, so this, this basic, the noise term is essentially there to thermalize the field inside the resonator to the right value, given the, th um, the statistical properties of radiation in the waveguide mode. So finally, I wanna also introduce this dimensionless parameter chi, um, given in this way, that's the coupler sort of how this coupler is different from the rest of the array, yeah? And this chi, uh, you really, you can't think of this turns out as a, um, as a perturbation, as a parameter of strength of coupling. And so chi small is weak coupling or perturbative limit, chi large is non-perturbative limit. Um, and chi equals one, you know, is interesting because then this, become, this unit becomes the same as the other in the array. And this is essentially the galvanic coupling limit that has been explored in experiments. So uh, in this form, the result is not very useful. Um, a very nice interpretable form can be obtained by using um, a singular function expansion of the kernel. This is a known, not so very well known technique in classical electromagnetism. Um, and we basically extended its applica application to here, uh, to quantum fields. Um, a, um, so you, uh, the, uh, these uh, modes, the singular functions can, can serve as modes, turns out. And you can uh, expand the fields at a given frequency S or I omega um, using those modes, yeah. Uh, so let me discuss the meaning of these modes because it is rather strange. What we are talking to about here is um, the modes that are suitable to expand any mode that is excited by a source at frequency capital omega, you know, place at X, X prime here uh, of by a source. And uh, they, those kinds of field in the far field outside in the waveguide, for instance, here's a 2D situation would obey asymptotic boundary conditions in this simple way, but they would be parametrically dependent on this capital frequency, frequency capital uh, omega. And so this parametric boundary conditions then give you a set of non-hermitian modes, and you can build the Green's function to propagate any field from a source. Yeah, so this is what the, the idea behind this singular function expansion, we will use these parametric modes to expand this radiation. I'm showing here, a basic, how these modes look for a basic situation of a transmission line cavity, a standard one with a qubit attached to it. These are exponentially, these modes are trigonometric functions, but they exponentially increase towards the loss boundary and are constant outside in, in exponential, um, they are absolute values, yeah. The important, another important point is that these modes turn out to be modified by the placement of source and you see this, uh, this zero coupling, chi equals zero, and non-zero coupling, how much it can modify in the specially cooked up situation. And this modification of modes is essentially what gives you finite, uh, di uh, finite rates for spontaneous emission if you wanna do a perturbative uh, calculation with renormalized modes. So here are some numerical results for this long cavity where we can get a glimpse into the physics as we tune coupling from perturbative to the non-perturbative regime. Spectrally, we have N plus one modes for each frequency here, you know, on the horizontal axis, you see the atomic frequency omega A and we tune it. And you see none of these modes are modified. They are pretty straight. And this atomic mode that is, goes through the resonator modes. We have um, these N plus one modes, they form a band 
and there's a bandage at the plasma frequency. This, um, now the width of these, this is calculated, the width of these resonances are also available, but we are not including that here because it's cluttering the behavior I wanna discuss. So we see that the atom undergoes several anti-crossings as it goes, gets through the resonator modes. They are very small, so you don't see any modification in resonator modes. And the reson um, so on the lower plot, I'm plotting only the atomic mode, yeah? And N here is the position along the cavity, along the resonator. And you see it's mostly localized at site zero where the atom is, very flat here. But um, as I tune the atomic frequency, this mode uh, you know, loses localization and, um, and delocalizes over the system. You don't quite clearly see it here. Um, you can see that in, in, uh, in this inverse participation ratio, which is a measure of localization used by um, people studying disorder, but you can sort of use it to see very clearly the behavior. This inverse participation ratio is one if the mode is fully localized. So the atomic mode is localized, but in small regions of atomic frequency, it gets delocalized is what you see here, yeah. As you increase now the, what I call the coupling to the full galvanic limit, what you see is now the atomic mode cannot be really distinguished anymore. All the modes of the resonator undergo some shift, tiny shifts, many more of the modes, as the frequency is tuning across this diagonal here. The red line is just the closest mode to the atomic mode, right? And they are essentially pinned in regions of atomic frequency to uh, these modes. And essentially the mode here, atomic mode is, doesn't really exist. It is melted into this background of uh, band modes of the resonator. Or in effect, the band mode now contains one more mode, um, so which is distributed. And as a, in spatial domain, you see a complete delocalization of the atomic mode. It, in, it of course, uh, displays some interesting nodal structure. But outside, it is localized again, right? You see IPR equals one here, right at the bandage. And uh, the frequency also sees she, a very strong lamp shift um, as, you know, um, in addition, yeah. So finally, I, I'm coming to the end. I, I'm out of time, I see. Um, the, uh, I wanna show what I, like sort of the, the basic uh, non-perturbative uh, to perturbative um, sort of crossover in a very clean way. I'm plotting here the, la the frequency of the atomic mode as I tune the coupling chi, yeah. And this is coupling chi equals one, which is the galvanic coupling limit. What you see here is that the frequency of the atom computed by the singular function expansion in red and the lamp shift and also calculated in perturbation theory via, um, where you calculate the lamp shift additional correction. And there are two ways of doing this, but each of them convert, uh, sort of diverges strongly as you come to this non-perturbative regime. So I call this really, I, I mean, I refer to this as an, the non-perturbative regime of coupling. Similarly for Purcell spontaneous emission rate of the atom, I'm comparing here, um, again, as, a, as, as I increase the coupling to standard formulas that are obtained through Fermi-Golden rule where the effective um, impedance of the array exactly calculated is used. Um, and that is, I believe gamma effective is in this dash line here. In, uh, in, and then the, the other limit is the one where we assume that the high impedance line is infinite length. Yeah, so there's no waveguide. That also misses the uh, exact calculation quite a bit. Um, and so you can say the non perturbative regime really starts here. This is the exact calculation. Um, yeah. So that you can also capture the dynamics. I'm out of time. So just, I guess, the last three slides, I can skip them safely because we have, we have just, we have, we have been, this is just new work, which, which is not complete yet, but we are carrying this through three, uh, to three dimensional superconducting materials. 
where we solve the exact order parameter equations and the light part and the Maxwell's equations essentially with fields that are gauge invariant um, given in this way and that they are exactly hybridized. Um, and you can use a, a formulation in, in terms of discrete differential forms to express these entire equations in two equations, which you can solve numerically. And it's essentially in, when you come down to transmission line limit of a three dimension structure, these equations uh, fall back exactly onto a transmission line equation. So, so here's just you know, how you can simulate a Josephson junction atom uh, inside a, um, a superconducting two-dimensional cavity. You see the fields penetrating into the superconductor and so on. So this works. You can also capture flux quantization um, properly and so on. So um, this brings me to the end of my talk. I'm uh, three minutes over. I want to thank everyone for listening and also point out the people involved in this um, in this uh, work. Kano Sinha was starting as an assistant professor in University of Arizona and Said Khan. Um, and yeah, this concludes my talk. Uh, thanks for this very impressive uh, talk. Uh, it's a pity that we can't have you here, but we can have a bit of a discussion now. You couldn't hear? Oh. No, it's a pity that you're not here. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. That for me. I tried I, without uh, the mask. All right, I was really worried you, you guys couldn't that hear is. anything. <laughs> Sorry about that. We enjoyed it to be here, here as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Hakan, for the nice presentation. Joachim here. Um, I, Joachim, I'm wondering, um, yeah, good to see you. I'm wondering about uh, fluctuations, say, of the, of the electromagnetic field, for example. Have you, have you uh, explored this as well? How it changes when you go, say, in the, in the strongly coupled regime, uh, when you have this hybridization, basically, how the, the uh, fluctuation properties change? So, um, can you, so I have to be very specific because we, we have essentially calculated. So one quantity we have calculated is the um, expectation. Let me, one second. Um, do you see this slide? Yes. Yes, we do see. Yeah, I, I, I skipped the slide, but I guess this could be related to what you're uh, oh, yeah. Asking me, I'm looking at the um, the expectation value of the field, uh, the occupation in a way, or the energy at the localized atomic site. So expectation value of N A, and um, we are able to compute this, and you can see that you know I'm plotting here the corresponding modes and how they hybridize with the rest you know here it's only living in mode one in inside one but here's it's a short cavity here just for illustration and um and then um so this is the spectrum of these transient oscillations i'm not showing here the long time limit of steady state i have some plot here that we have calculated in very extreme coupling limits let me show you that um, so this is the long time limit of what I've shown you. And the interesting thing that we observe here, and these calculations are not complete. This is why I didn't show you uh, still being, uh, we are still discussing this. Um, I'm showing here the exit, uh, the, uh, the energy in, uh, in on site, atomic site, as a function of time when it started initially with some energy there. And you see that in the long time limit, depending on the coupling, the steady state is different. Mm -hmm. This steady state, when, when you go to couple, small coupling, chi equals zero, zero, one is one example of it, it saturates. And that value is the value of the thermal, um, 
uh, value of the wave, the thermal uh, sort of the temperature of the waveguide here, we, we have chosen the temperature of the waveguide to be 50 millikelvin. But as you increase the coupling, the steady state uh, occupation changes. Yeah. So clearly, uh, it, it looks like an effective thermalization to a steady state value. But what is really happening is that thermalization does happen, just happens to another mode, which is delocalized. And then you, of course, just look at the mode that is uh, that, that, that just a local site occupation. You see this thermalization that is not equal to the temperature outside. And you can plot, you can uh, compute an effective temperature as a function of chi. Uh, as temperature, uh, as the coupling goes down, it saturates with the waveguide as expected. Uh, so this is, we are still wetting this calculation because we have, don't have much exact to compare to um, and another computational scheme. So this is why I, I didn't want to discuss this here, but we can, I mean, it's within the reach. Sure, thank you very much. May I, may I ask another question? This is a more speculative question. I mean, as you as you know, vacuum QED has the problem of renormalization. Yeah? Uh, so I mean, this is what Feynman was, has, has worked about. And my question, I mean, this then they, they somehow found and developed methods to um, to deal with this renormalization problem. Uh, and my question is, uh, I mean, is it conceivable to think again about this problem? in this regime which is not accessible in vacuum QED. So do we, I mean, as I said, it's very speculative, I don't have any idea, but, but is this, I mean, at, at least conceivable to, to use the techniques that you develop in this, in this strong, ultra strong, super strong, extremely strong coupling regime to learn something about this field theory that we cannot say that we do not find in the, in the weak coupling regime in terms of renormalization? Right. So, the, the, you know, I, I will uh, tell you an equally speculative story here about this. It's been in our minds uh, since we started working on, on this problem in 2017. Um, and I think there are a number of other groups who are thinking about the same thing. Um, um, so, yes, I, I believe um, one, you know, now we are looking at, a, at this problem of QED renormalization, not with individual electrons, point-like electrons, but with matter, with uh, solid state materials. So, uh, and it is not clear whether um, how a good theory for that situation looks like. 1D, uh, you know, when we study transmission line cavities, just because there was a problem that, that you know, computing per cell decay rate in, the, in that setting or lamp shifts. Um, the, the general feeling was um, that this is effective field theory. You know, it's subgap, it's only valid, valid subgap. Still, you can say, well, you know, imagine a superconductor whose effect, whose critical temperature is infinity. There's no problem imagining that. And there you can really see that these quantities still diverge. And if you take into account this gauge invariant description uh, gives you a convergent result, but it, it gives us nothing, not, it's not a fundamental theory, but it tells us why, how we can get finite results. And the big issue was how to do this in 3D because that's where we live. And this is, you know, is this attempt that we just started um, in here. Um, this is where we want to go. Um, and there, in, if, if we find the same kind of situation in 3, 3D, then I would say it's going to be very interesting to study, go back to QED, fundamental issues QED, and study them in engineer setting. And theoretically as well, there's still a lot of unanswered questions here. It's very interesting. Thank you for, for that question, Joachim. Thank you. Um, just a, maybe a illegitimate analogy question. 
So in, in uh, ultra-cold atoms, in two-body collisions, there was some really nice physics done with Feshbach resonances uh, going from uh, scattering to trapped states um, really close to the boundary, which seems, it, it just visually, it strike, struck me as uh, reminiscent of your uh, highly hybridized states as the coupling is increased to the sort of uh, asymptotically trapped uh, long uh, spatial uh, um, when you go, when you release the, the atom from the cavity from the quantized states in terms of frequency. So it, it, I was wondering if that analogy is valid or useful in any way. The analogy to collisional states of, uh, of uh, atoms where you can change the, the coupling there and, and go from trap to uh, scattering states and, and yes, there was so some unitary physics analogy, that was done there. I understand, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Um, the analogy is, you know, you have a competition between localized physics and a continuum there also in, in collisions with atoms, right? And that to, the, to that extent, the analogy is similar, though the field there is in, you know, atomic field, uh, a matter field, right? With that caveat. And, but the, this physics that I'm discussing here is very analogous to spin boson physics, which is a very general model um, that has been studied in many, many contexts. Um, in spin boson model, when the coupling to, of the impurity to the atom, oh, sorry, to the continuum increases, um, when, and you see, you know, strong coupling effect, let, effects, let's say, um, a, a perspective that has not been studied a lot in that context is how, you know, that there are ways of thinking about that physics of the spin boson model um, with um, modes, effective modes that are created between the impurity and the bosonic bath. And, um, and probably, I'm sure someone has studied this, coming up with effective modes of that structure of that spin boson model in various, uh, you know, regimes of uh, density of states. Uh, and you would see a very similar behavior there, probably as the coupling increases, that an effective mode decays into the, uh, sort of spatially delocalizes into the continuum. Um, and yeah, I, I think uh, in the collisional, you know, for an electronic uh, or atomic field, you have probably similar effects and there's probably an analogy from the point of view of the equation um, describing the matter field in that context with the, uh, with the sort of the hybridized field here. Um, and maybe there's a value. Well, I guess all that I'm saying is there's a value to think in terms of hybridized modes. That's, that's the one way of doing non-perturbative calculations. I'm sorry, this answer was probably too long, but... Um, Okay, I think that is enough. Um, I thank uh, you again and all the other speakers of today's uh, session. And